Good day, ladies and gents. Welcome to this next session today. We're going to be looking at pressure on buildings, specifically looking at internal and external pressure on buildings. And when it comes to wind load, my experience is this is one of the sections where people often misunderstand. The concepts are quite simple, but often they're just misapplied. And I think once you can get the basics of what we're trying to do, it'll hopefully help you. So we're going to be having a look now at this little model I've got here and you'll see there's some letters and zones marked on it all the way around and we're going to be having a look at how do we generate pressures to design this building relative to our South African code of, of design. So at this stage we would have calculated a wind pressure somewhere in the area. So somewhere wherever this building is in the middle of wherever it is, in a farm, in a city, wherever it is, we now have a pressure of 0.9 kPa or whatever it is. But now, depending on the shape of the building and where the wind blows from, the pressures on the building will change. And also, depending on the shape of the building, the pressures will change. So we want to now start getting to those pressures and those pressure coefficients. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see then that the, I've got two different colors printed on here, blue and red, and those specifically indicate different directions that the wind is blowing. So all the red directions would account for when the wind comes, hits this face, so it's my building is currently orientated like this, the wind is coming from where you're sitting, hits this building, blows over the top, and then out the back and then also you'll see we're going to create suction pressures on the side. Alternatively, the blue is when the wind blows and hits on the long face. So it comes, hits this long face, goes over the roof, around the sides and then creates once again suction on this back face. And all the letters correspond to, to that direction. So just be very careful. It's all about the direction of your building relative to how the wind reaches it. And remember, the wind could blow from any direction. So you will build this building somewhere, but the wind could come from pretty much any side during the life of the building. So normally what we will do though in a symmetric, we'll build, um, design the building for wind from the one side, and then just mirror our design. And so then it'll account for, doesn't matter where the wind comes from the left or the right, and we'll have a, a safe structure. That it is a difference when the building's not symmetric. For instance, a monopitch roof. So if there's a single slope from one side to the other, then what we will normally do is you have to design from wind from one direction and from the other direction. So there's an extra wind load case we need to do. Now, let's start having a look at the pressure coefficients. And firstly, you'll see that around the side of the building, I've got A, B, C, D, E. Those are the wall pressure coefficients. And then on the roof, I've got F, G, H, I, and then J if needs be. And uh, the important thing to realize is that when you determine the pressures on a building, there are two sets of tables you need. You need one set of information from the walls and one set of information for the roof. They act together. You always have wall pressures plus roof pressures for a typical building. So you will first go and look up the pressures to get A, B, C, D, E. And then you will go look up the pressures and get you know, F, G, H, I, J, K, or you know, whichever pressures you need over the top. So the two go together, making up one entire building. When it comes to looking at the pressures, start thinking about now why would they, for instance, the red letters be these funny shapes and the funny zones we've got. So we've got D on the end, but if we have a look down the side of the building, you'll see I've got an A and a B and a C, etc. down the length of the building. And I've got the small little zone A, a slightly bigger zone B, and then zone C after that. And if you have a look at the design tables, you'll find the highest pressures are in zone A. Now, let's think about why would that be. So here, for instance, I'm going to draw some wind flow lines. So here is our structure, and now the wind comes across and uh, impacts the f uh, this end face. So there is our, our wind. It's coming down, and it's affecting it. Now what happens is the wind will flow around the side, both sides of the building. And when it cr does that, what it does is it creates vortices around the end. So on both sides here, 
you're going to start creating vortices. So revolving, circulating, almost little twisters, I suppose you could call it, um, due to the turbulence there. And this creates higher pressures, normally suction, but it can also create um, inward pressures as well. So you have these suction um, pressures that are very high locally. And so that will, in this zone, create a pressure. Where in the next zone, you still get a little bit. And then in my zone B, I will have a slightly lower pressure. But if I continue on down, by the time I get to zone C, uh, down the side, and remember, I'm just only looking at the red, we have much lower pressure. So yes, there is pressure, but it's sort of a general suction as the wind flows next to it. Because now the wind is flowing all the way down. So that's why when I design my building, I'll have zones A, B, and C down the side. So the end zone, the, the windward face, remember windward is where the wind hits. I'll have a single pressure, a zone D. And then on my leeward face, where the wind moves away from, I will also then have um, a suction pressure because here is it is, and then the wind pressure comes around the wind comes around and creates a suction on the back face. Depending on the geometry, you may or may not need all of zones A, B, and C. And you'll have seen on the models, on the one side it's got A, B, and C, and the other side it's got A and B. And that's a function of E. Um, e is the minimum of um, a, B and 2H, and the dimensions B and D are always related to the wind direction. So you'll see here the wind coming across and then the B and D direction are exactly as shown. So if your wind changes by 90 degrees, then the B and D dimensions will then rotate 90 degrees with the building and be on the other side. So if the wind comes from the top, then they will, will turn sideways. And now, depending on this, this E value you determine, you can find out which of the three categories you should use, and then you can see, do you need zones A, B, and C, A, and B, or just A? Now let's think about also the roof and how the same thing applies to the roof. So if I show this to you here, what you will find is on the roof you have a similar pattern where you've got your F and G, these small zones up the top, zones F to zone G, a very localized band of high pressures right around the edge. Behind it I've got zone H, once again a higher pressure, and then continuing through as the wind comes across and I've got zone I, and this will be then the a lower pressure all the way down. What pressure must I now apply though to my building? And all these pressures act at the same time. So the wind blows, and then all these pressures, zone A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, that all, um, you multiply a coefficient by the pressure and you'll get a, an approximation of this. We're trying to take a very complex phenomena. Wind, it's constantly fluctuating, it's up and down, and especially one thing I forgot to mention, on the roof you can have upward pressures or downward pressures in zones because this turbulence can either suck or push down. Now, all these pressures act at the same time, well, we will assume, and in reality they don't, because often, you know, while the pr something's blowing on the front side or, or the back side, it, it's not quite at the same time. Now, uh, when we design the building, you'd have to look at which part of the building am I designing. For instance, now, if I was, the, these dotted lines are truss lines, so there's, a, for instance, a truss or a raft or a portal frame all the way down, and there's another one all the way down. When you design one of them, you'd have to look at what it load is acting on the, the frame that I'm designing. For instance, here's my truss, or my raft, or my columns, all the way down and up. And... Uh, Depending on which load direction I am looking at, I will need to accommodate different pressure coefficients. For instance, if I'm using the, the red pressure coefficients, I've got a band here like that. So that's the, the tributary width that is acting on this um, portal frame or trust um, structure, more or less. It's not exactly, depending on if the purlins are continuous or not, but for simplicity I've got a, a band here. And then have a look at, inside this band, what pressures fall on this tributary area. And you'll see on this side I've got zone H, 
and on this side, for instance, I've got zone I. So if I was designing this this uh, portal frame here, I'd have to have some of the lower pressure, some of the high pressure, so I could probably take a, a weighted average. But what happens, for instance, if I'm designing a purlin? This is, for instance, the tributary area of the purlin um, that I'm drawing in green here. And you'll see this purlin, well, sorry, this, this tributary area, which acts as a point load there, so this acts as a point load there, I will have, you know, I would get from that area. But coming back, I mentioned a purlin now. Let's say I was designing a purlin. It would depend where on the building it is, what pressures I use. So for instance here, let's say I've got a purlin from the edge of the building, from the gable face to the first um, truss line. Some of that um, purlin falls within G, some in H, and maybe even some falls in another zone. So I might have a patterned loading across this, this purlin. And one thing though, in reality, you're not going to have a m this exact thing happening all at once, where there's this magical and sudden jump between 1.8 kPa and 0.9 kPa, whatever the numbers are. It's not going to be sudden, but this at least approximates the fact we've got localized turbulence, lower pressures, and then lower pressures after that. So if I was designing this purlin here, I would design for zone G and H. But for instance, now if I was designing the purlin down the other side of the building, down here, I would be in only an I. If the wind only does, comes from one direction, but it's likely, remember, that the wind will come from or almost guaranteed the wind will come from the other direction as well. So I will then need to consider this purlin symmetrically. So it could be on either end of the building. So that's why you normally design the worst case and copy and paste for the other side of the building to make sure that it doesn't matter which side of the building the, the wind comes from, you have the, um, the, the, a safe solution. Okay, so that was just having a look at where do the pressures act, and it will depend on what part of the building. And for instance, even if I was looking at my my columns, what loads do I put my columns on my columns? Here's my my column, and I've got a zone acting here. Some of the zone falls within B. Well, actually, all of this falls in zone B. So I'd take the pressure coefficient, my CPE, and then uh, does multiply it by the pressure and I'd have a, then a load to apply here. Same thing on the other side, load to apply here. And that is then for that the wind, the red wind direction when the wind comes and hits the gable face. But say exact same um, methodology would be followed if it for instance was this this blue direction, the when the wind hits this long face and um, then goes over the ridge and down the other side. If I was designing this band I would then be all in zone D on the front, all in zone E on the back. So there's my zone E, all in zone E on the back. And then as I do over the roof, I would design it so I would have zones F, H, J, and I over the roof. So I'd have a couple of different bands over the, the roof that we would consider. With the pressures that we've been talking about, I keep saying you multiply a pressure coefficient by a wind pressure. But one thing that is also important is how big is what you are designing? For instance, here is, is my building. And I'm going to be designing all the different components of it, the sheeting and the purlins and the rafters and the trusses and whatever else forms part of this building. Most items I design structurally have an area bigger than 10 square meters. And so then there isn't a huge difference in pressures between whether it's 10 or 50 or 100 square meters, what I'm designing. But let's say now I was designing some flashings. You know, some, the, the flashings are the piece that kind of close the edge of your building. You don't normally design them, but let's say for some reason you were or you're designing a little I don't know, plate or Something small that bolts on the end of the building, I don't know, a satellite dish or something funny. And uh, you were going to fix it in one area. And so now we have a small item that's there or there or wherever it is. And this is, let's say, two square meters. As I mentioned earlier, the wind is constantly fluctuating. So as the wind blows, it's changing the whole time. And while this little section, let's say there's upward pressure, there's downward pressure on this face. And so you're not going to get maximum pressures everywhere all at once. 
as the area gets bigger, the chance of everything being maximum upward or downward all at once is reduced. So if you have a very small area, you actually need to design for a bigger pressure coefficient. So for instance, if I have a, an area of one square meter of what I am designing, so if I am designing a solar panel that fits on the edge of the building, I would use a CPE1 value, a pressure coefficient for an item that has a one square meter area. And so I'd use a CPE1 if this was one square meter. If this was two square meters, I would use a slightly reduced pressure coefficient, a CPE2. If this was suddenly now this area here, and I'm determining the point load on the, the rafter, I would design for a CPE 10, a 10 square meter area of what I am designing. And so be very careful with you know, how big is it that you're designing. And also, for instance, I designed the solar panel and it's CPE two square meters, let's say it's a two square meter um, one. But now it sits on a purlin and there's a whole bunch of solar panels. When I design each solar panel on its own, I will design them for two square meters. Let's say there's a row of solar panels all the way down. But now if I was designing the support structure for that solar panels and they support five of these solar panels or 12 of these solar panels, suddenly I have a tributary bigger than 10 square meters, so I use CPE 10. So either it's one or lower, use CPE one, somewhere in between there's an equation to interpolate and then 10 square meters and bigger, I will use CPE 10. Another aspect to look at when it comes to determining pressures is that I have mentioned a few times now that the pressures are fluctuating and also as it blows the wind will hit on the one side, let's say now I'm looking at the blue pressure coefficient, so it'll come and strike zone face D, move across the building and then off the other side and then cause a suction pressure on E. These pressures on zone D and E may not be the maximum at the same time. And especially you can imagine as this building gets wider and wider and wider and flatter and flatter and flatter, the chance of maximum pressures on the one side happening at the same time as the other reduce. So in the code allowance is made that for wider and flatter buildings, you can multiply the pressures here and here by 0.85. So you reduce the pressure by 15% to, to account for what's called lack of correlation. Lack of correlation is simply the fact that as the wind, let's say there's a big gust of wind because we're designing for big gusts. The gust comes across. The chance of the gust influencing this side and that side at the same time is reduced. So I can reduce my total pressure by multiplying the pressures here and here by 0.85. And so that is the lack of correlation that you would you'd need. If I was designing a little solar panel on the one side, on zone E, I would only design for, well, I would design for the full, pr full pressure. What happens on the other side of the building has no influence on my solar panel here. So I forget about that clause in the code. However, if I'm designing the entire portal frame, different story. Then I both pressures are acting at the same time, my zones D and zone E, the um, windward and the leeward phase. So therefore I would multiply both zone D's pressures or point loads and zone E's pressures or point loads by 0.85 to account for that lack of correlation. The last thing we're going to be looking at is internal pressure coefficient. So here's my building and when the wind blows, it can pressurize the inside of the building. So here's the inside. And just imagine now that we have some doors somewhere. Let's say now there's one there on the side of the building. It's now that's a big roller shutter door. And then there's another one here and another one wherever it is here. So when the wind blows, let's say now I'm using the, the blue pressure coefficients now, the wind will come across and for instance, where these two doors are, you can imagine that the wind comes out, it's pushing on this face. If these are suddenly big openings, that wind will rush into the building and pressurize it. So what will happen is where these doors are, it will allow wind in and then pressurize the inside. So if there are openings, we can internally pressurize or depressurize the building. So as, for instance, it comes across, 
it will now, what's happening inside this building will be a fa function of what's happening in zone D. So whatever the wind pressure is, including my pressure coefficient, will influence what's happening inside the building because these doors are allowing pressure in. But at the same time, we have another door. Let's say it's also open. It's now in zone B on the side. That's actually a suction pressure, so that'll be depressurizing the building. And so, depending on where your doors are, you get pressurization and depressurization, suction and pushing inside the building. And so, as the wind comes across, I'm looking at the blue, it comes, it sucks it up, and at the same time, we may have pressures that either push in or suck away from the roof inside. And so that we need to, to account for. And the code accounts for that through internal pre pressure coefficient, CPI, um, coefficient of pressure, internal CPI. And there are different ways to account for that. The first thing is to think about what I was mentioning to you, the fact that where the doors are causes pressurization or depressurization. So I will first look at where all my doors. If there are doors around the building, there are clauses to then account for multiple openings. But the problem is reality. As a structural engineer, you design these buildings, you have no idea will the doors be open or closed. So you normally have to assume, okay, all open, all closed. But also throughout the life of a structure, often doors are added and doors are removed. So you often can't be that precise with these. If you have very big dominant doors, huge roller shutter doors, or let's say it's an airplane hanger or something, but airplane hanger you would look at it more as a canopy, um, then you would know pretty much where they are and those could be open or closed and so you, you would design around it. But in many cases, if there's lots of little doors and there's, um, for instance, a ridge vent for, for smoke and all sorts of other things, often it's quite difficult to do this. So then you, you do have a simplified clause of using either um, you know, 0.2 or minus 3, uh, 0.3 pl uh, suction or, or uh, for positive or negative pressures as an approximation. That's sort of a general, for most buildings, that, that kind of covers it. But when you have what's called a dominant wall, a dominant wall is when you've got a bunch of openings and those openings govern what happens inside the building. So this would be a dominant wall because all my openings are down this side. And so I would have a look at, I'd look at the area of these openings, so all the doors and maybe I've got some vents or whatever else it is on there. I'd look at the ratio of the doors in this face ratio to the, the openings on any other face. And so if the areas on one face is more than a certain amount um, bigger than all the, the openings on other faces, it becomes a dominant wall. It means when the wind comes, this wall pretty much governs what happens inside. So I would take the pressure inside as a function of the pressure on this face. And so that's important is firstly, is the wall dominant? Um, so we identify yes. And then there's also another clause in terms of how dominant is it? So in terms of how dominant, if the area of openings in the dominant wall is twice the area of the openings in the remaining facades, use the following equation. So you take 75% of the external pressure as internal. <clears throat> so that's when you have a dominant wall and it's twice the area, the openings on your dominant wall are twice the area of any other wall. But then, if you have the clause below, if the area of openings in the dominant is at least three times the area of the openings in the remaining facades, use the following equation, 0.9 CPE. So this is the case where it's very dominant, that you've got very large openings that pretty much totally govern what happens inside, and most of the pressure that happens outside now results in an internal pressure. And so you'll see either was 75% or 90%, or as you saw earlier, when you get outside of that, then you actually have to look at where all the doors and windows are. Now, in a big warehouse, this can be possible. But as soon as you end up with, let's say, a multi-story building with lots of doors and windows and all sorts of things, that's where these calculations become quite difficult and sometimes not that, that meaningful, uh, especially when you there will be all sorts of different scenarios with open and close. And even if you take everything open, you may struggle to quantify the area of openings when there's things such as vents, etc., that have not been quantified. So with this, hopefully this um, section and this lecture has given you a good overview of 
How do you take a pressure from a wind and then apply it to a building? How do you get an internal and external pressure acting on a building? Because those you would then multiply by the, the, the pressure and to get then uh, design values. And then with that, you can start going ahead and designing the different components of the building, which we will cover in a worked example soon. Okay, thank you very much.